Hi, and welcome to episode 49 of Finding Your Way Through Therapy, a returning guest, but this time we didn't wait a whole season. Um, we're the last episode, last interview of the season, and me and Jen knew we would just yap it away in the first episode, so we were definitely going to do a second episode, and instead of waiting, we're going to do it right away. So um, Jen Nakai is going to introduce herself in case you don't know her, but we just had a conversation in episode 48, so hopefully you go back to that. But uh, Jen, welcome again to Finding Your Way Through Therapy. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for having me. My name is Jennifer Nakai, and I'm a therapist licensed in Massachusetts. And I work with children, adults, ad individuals across the lifespan, couples and families. <laughs> and I think I think that what Aeon. what's that? At Aeon in this in this company, <laughs> Aeon Counseling. <laughs> You, you know, you know, and I think about it, all the stuff we've talked about, we've worked the spectrum literally between me and you, we probably have seen every age, gender, race, racist, uh, <laughs> yes. yep. uh, we've really, we really gone through the gamut of uh, ethnicities and everything else. So I think that's why we get along so well. Even worked with uh, people who are racists. Yes. And including them as well. <laughs> and we we've definitely uh, had a lot of good conversations off uh, this podcast in regards to that. But uh, always, always good to have someone who's been around around the block with different things in their work so that, you know, it really helps. I, I always say that it makes us humble. It helps us really understand how privileged we are. I'm, I'm a white male. I'm never going to pretend I'm not. And I know that I'm privileged, but sometimes it's just the small things you realize how privileged you are. And when you're bitching about stuff, you're just kind of like bitching. Which is perfectly fine. Bitch away. Well, I have nothing right now, except I got to go back to what we said the last episode. I got to go with that. So, you know, we talked about the weight. Yes. Of let's do a recap about weight. Yes, we talked about the weight of different things, of unchecked thoughts, of you know, us versus them, our primal brain. Uh, we talked about the loss of control and how yoga can give us a little bit of that back and how we have friends who are no longer friends and people that we now connect even more. But I, I can't remember the exact context, the context of when I, we talked about the weight. It was the weight of the pandemic on therapists and the weight on relationships that like the election had and uh, you know, different health decisions had, even vaccinations affected friendships and interactions, at yeah. least for me. So there was no fat joke involved here. Uh, and you know, it's also very ironic that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm down a few pounds myself in the last, few, in the last couple of months. Jen has like, I can't remember. You lost a lot of weight because you're, exactly, you're an athlete now, from what I understand. An athlete. I've lost exactly 115 pounds in four years. So not bad. That is. And, and now you're like deadlifting like an athlete, apparently. So literally, yes, so. I we have made it to the next level. I now know the secrets of the skinny people. Uh, have shared it with me. I had to pay them. They didn't just volunteer the information to me. I had to pay them to tell me what the secrets were and now we have them turns out there's a lot of powders <laughs> involved oh okay well you know I, I i maybe that's what i gotta do but i guess when we talk about powders i know a lot of powders that were distributed during the pandemic from well, people powders those are different powders i'm talking about oh. one you could buy whole foods trader joe's types of places okay i'm talking about protein powders <laughs> let's be real but, I just thought it would be a good joke to make. But okay, well, yeah, no, let's include all the addictions in there because I think a lot of people reported that during the pandy, their weight went significantly up. I'm talking about like 20 pounds in three to four months, which is really unhealthy, has happened to me before. Um, but imagine the crisis and the traumas of the world on top of getting unhealthier on top of a virus that is threatening your health on top of needing to keep the best immune system available, right. no pressure or anything. 
Uh, but um, I definitely felt the pressure of keeping up with my health more, <laughs> more than usual. And that also meant watching substances, all substances. Right. <clears throat> because it, I could see even people around me drinking way, way too much. And even that affects your weight. Well, I think that sometimes we, you know, you look at even the like TV, whatever you use, streaming services, or even like uh, social media. We, you know, during the pandemic, it was almost normalized that you got to get hammered because, you know, hey, you have time to yourself. There's nothing else to do. Might as well drink. Everyone thought it was really funny to have a shirt that says, like, it's wine time. <laughs> I have a glass in my hand just for wine, just at home, drinking wine all the time. They don't know if this is water or if it's a uh, vodka and uh, orange juice. It looks, uh -huh. like it looks like crystal light. It looks like crystal light. It's one of those supplements that you just talked about that you can get a Trader <laughs> Joe's. Get, Good. Yeah, Good. It, it helps fill me up during the afternoon. I've learned that. Oh, yeah. With, the, with casein? Does it have casein in it? I didn't know this was going to be a quiz. Um, I believe so, but I'm not 100% sure. Probably. I think it's casein. I have a little creatine in there. Creatine oh. tends to make me feel a little fuller. Do you have all your blockchain amino acids? Hey. <laughs> I don't even know what those are yet. I, they just keep telling me about it. The skinny people keep giving me the secrets, but I still have to study them. I don't, I don't catch on right away. <laughs> I got oh. it. I, I don't either, but I turn to food because that's always been my comfort. So, uh, you know, I, all joking aside, at one point I did have a pretty bad problem with alcohol um, and knock on wood, that's fairly under control at this point in, in the sense that I haven't drank excessively since 2003. And I'm very happy about that. That doesn't mean the problem is completely gone. I, as people misunderstand about addiction, it just doesn't poof disappear. It's there forever. But I also gain my other addiction is food. So not being able to go to the gym, not running, not getting out of the house. Because, you know, I remember in the first reports, like if, if it's coming off the water. And so I went from I at one point I did weigh about 260 pounds and I had brought my weight down, which was great. And I enjoyed it and all that. And I went from that to um, I was almost a 225, which if you don't want to see me at BMI levels, because if I'm at BMI levels, you're going to think I'm dying. Um, <laughs> no. So, but yeah, I gained like, I want to say about 20 pounds during the pandemic. You and the majority of the world. But I think it's because we turned to things that made us feel good, right? Because people misunderstand food and, you know, maybe it does fit more with addiction than I thought, because, you know, we get addicted to those carbohydrates. They make us feel good. Oh, candy alone. I mean, you, you crave it, you, you crave it like an essential nutrient and it's not, not like that. It really isn't. I mean, I feel like I turned it around for myself because I was already on a wellness journey. Right. Fitness track before the pandemic had started, I had already lost a good amount of the weight. Uh, but still when I found myself having a little bit more time to really plan out what I wanted to eat, how I was going to access this food, because that became an issue as well. Right. I had to really examine my relationship with food during the pandemic and uh, having it, having the privilege of having it delivered versus uh, having to go to a grocery store myself. That was a whole other trauma that I had not even thought about where it was like food insecurity, um, but on a totally different capitalism level of like, what if there's no more production of food? What are we going to do? <laughs> and right. I, and I panicked. I, I wasn't sure what was going on. Um, but I, but more, you know, on a more sad note, those of us who are lucky enough to turn to candy and food and had access to it, I think in the long run, we're better off than the folks who were already pretty far in the trenches of their addiction. And by the time COVID really, really locked us down, uh, they went into heavier substances and heavier and heavier and more of it um, to the point of like, I've lost a number of friends to COVID mm -hmm. and to the COVID symptoms 
related to secondary to the, the comorbid COVID symptoms of the folks who maybe were feeling really stressed out with work and tried out some cocaine and that was laced. Right. right? So from accidental, like people who rarely use to the folks who are using all the time to going too far. So if good friends who I knew were self-medicating and then it just got to the point where the body gave up. Right. And I think that we turn to any type of addiction to make ourselves feel better. And if we're dealing with stress, substances are a great idea for so many people. And, you know, when, you know, the, the hardest part of the pandemic is that I, I heard this from a lot of people, including first responders and medical staff, like, oh, we have a lot less overdoses. I'm like, no, we don't. We have more bodies because people are using alone. People are isolated. People are using more than they should. And they don't have kind of like that guy next to them or that woman next to them going, hey, call 911. I think they're not responding. Yeah, we, we suddenly didn't have that expectation of being at the office by nine in the morning. Even just that is enough for certain people to be like, all right, I got to sober up to go in. Right. But you don't have that. So I feel like people were just using 24 hours a day. And uh, from affecting their regular emotions, their underlying uh, baseline anger and right. fear and happiness, but also their sadness and their anxiety. And there was a lot of that. Everything from edibles to really heavy stuff to alcohol being the most praised, I feel like, on social media. Everyone was just like, it's wine time. And I was like, all right, well, let's make a big joke out of it. Sure. Sure. Right. And even, you know, um, I think about THC as being another one that was kind of like normalized. But, um, you know, people Today, as we celebrated for the high holiday 420. We're recording on 420. We're recording on 420 yeah. and it's not quite 420 yet, but uh, let's light one up for everyone. No, I don't I don't have anything uh, on the podcast by the therapists. Yes. And we're just saying that we're supporting it by doing so. <laughs> <laughs> but. But I think that when we normalize it, you know, like people ask me all the time about, oh, they legalize pot. Are you OK with that? I'm like, I have no problem with legalizing pot, frankly. But some people get really addicted psychologically and we need to realize that those things occur. And I think that that's a lot of the stuff that happened during the pandemic, too. Oh, for sure. Especially the ones that are the the uh, the harmless drugs. This is harmless. I I, I use it for sleep. Well, that's Xanax is also used for sleep. <laughs> it's like, you right. know, a lot of heavy narcotics are also used in the exact same way, FYI. And uh, we tend to rely on that a lot. And I can also see how a lot of people didn't lose their minds during the pandemic because of the edibles, thank goodness. So it's like, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that you were resting, that you got some rest. So there's, you know, that medicinal side was very interesting to see how that played out as I as an essential item. Did you know it became an essential item? Oh, I did not know it was an essential in the state item. In Massachusetts, oh yeah, dispensaries did not close. Uh, only the recreational side closed and then the medical side became an essential business. Wow, I did not know that. <laughs> but I think that that's what I kind of get to also is like I, I heard many stories of people really losing it because they didn't have access to their edibles and or their pot. So whether you believe it's physical and I'm not here to just like, we're not here to kind of argue that I'm, unless you want to, I don't want to argue it, but psychologically you become extremely dependent on your THC, whether you're using Indica or um, what's the other one. Sativa. Thank you very much. Uh, the expert here. I was going to say an expert <laughs> of some sort, right? <laughs> Busted. Yes. But I think that if you I've seen many people tell me they got really, really angry when they didn't have access to it. So when people tell me it's not addictive, I'm like, but really, isn't it a little bit at least? Yeah. yeah. Oh, totally. Especially for sleep. I've seen clients uh, struggle with being able to just go, fall asleep regularly again uh, six months after weaning themselves off of any THC whatsoever. And it's intense because all the emotions show up at night, right before bed. Yes. 
Remember that mistake you were you made when you were seven years old? Think about it now and try to sleep. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what did I not say to that person that I could have totally got them with? And then I, I didn't say it by mistake. I didn't say it. <laughs> right. Or, you know, oh, I've got a great comeback to that. Do I have your phone number? Should I tell them that? <laughs> should I send it? Should I post it now? No. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I had a perfect comeback. So that's all we think about. But in all seriousness, I do feel like I lost a good, so pardon my dog is screaming at someone outside of my door as I'm recording a podcast. Yes. Moses Nakai. Um, I, I feel like I lost people to straight up COVID pneumonia, you know, hospitalization and isolation. And then we also lost people to straight up overdoses. And that's the part that got me. And even though I was totally ready and I did podcasts on like, let's be ready for the second pandemic and what that looks like. And that's going to be a mental health crisis. It still shocked me. Right. I mean, you, we, you know, we've talked about a particular person in the past and I know that you put it on your social media and that was a heavy loss for you. Yeah, I mean, this was one of the mental health champions that I've always loved and respected in, in our industry, taught me the most about bedside manner, taught me the most about just how to talk to people and comfort them. And he was such a good person working in a hospital, like such a good person to have in an emergency Right. that I feel almost guilty that, that nobody knew what he was going through to the point where we couldn't comfort him. Because there was no comforting because at that point it was just other substances and like substances for the morning versus substances for at night. Right. But then you just worked a 16 hour shift. Right. And you have to be back at work in, in eight hours, but that doesn't count the hour it takes you to get to work and the hour it takes you to get home. Please hold. Will do. Give me, let's do a quick. It'll be, it'll be edited. Let me see what's going on. Laura, I don't know if you're listening to this. I'm just going to keep on recording. If you can edit it out. Uh, appreciate it. Okay. Juvan will fix this. All right. We're good. We're back now. Well, I think that when you, you go home and you, you know, you, you got to come off a 16 hour shift. I mean, I've worked in ERs. You have too. There's something about it that kind of like is like, be like, oh, you just get home and go to sleep. Oh yeah. It's that easy. It's not. It's definitely not, especially not after you're dealing with trauma after trauma after trauma after trauma. Um, and, then, and then let's add a pandemic over the top and everything that goes with that too for that poor individual. And it's just too hard sometimes. Yeah. In my friend's case, I know I checked in with him a couple of times when I was going through my own inventory of like, here's the people that I want to take care of and I want to make sure I'm okay because I want to see you survive and I would be scared without you in the world. Right. And I just remember him reporting back being like, yep, in the emergency room every day, you know, not changing anything about the rhythm. And I know the rhythm of my life, as I had mentioned in the last podcast, changed significantly to a point where almost the same rhythm would not be tolerable for me anymore. Like right. I feel like we were doing way too much before. Uh, and, and I actually appreciate this rhythm more, but he never changed that rhythm. And I think that quite literally killed him. It's not, it's not sustainable. You know, one of the, the hardest things, and, you know, I do have friends who are in recovery or have worked on the recovery or what have you, I think shame is so difficult for any type of addiction. Now you work in an ER and you do that work. I think that the, and I'm not saying that shame is not very heavy everywhere else, but I think in our field, it's even heavier if that makes any sense sometimes. I mean, look at what happened in the last uh, podcast. Things got really heavy really quickly. And it was almost like shameful to talk about my emotions, but at the same time, it's like, wait a second. Why this is, this is a universal experience. We're all going through something different, worse, better, whatever. But I, yeah, amongst practitioners, it's like, do you have your therapist? Do you have your support team? Who's there with you? Do you live by yourself? We all need somebody at some, at some point. 
Right. But I think that you also touched about it last, last podcast last week. And to me, it's a little bit of what the shame is too. Well, Hmm. you know, it's sometimes self-imposed and sometimes it's also come from other people. It comes from other people. Well, you know, and again, I'm not having this issue right away. I'm going to knock on wood, but let's say I do fall into something to help me sleep. Let's say I go to, you know, heavy duty use of Ambien. Um, how do I bring it up to Jen? I mean, she's a practitioner. How she's going to perceive me? She's going to see me at this week. I think that that shame is extremely heavy in our field, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. People will see you as med seeking right away if you mention any sort of history with substances. Right. And I mean, I see it all the time, even the way people have to go about obtaining their medications to maintain their sobriety. It's like even CVS is a big culprit of all of that in just the way that they treat you as they see which medication you're picking up it's immediately judgment nothing but judgment right away and it's like really because this person is actually doing everything they need to do to right their, their mental health essentially and and i think that that's what the the stuff has happened also through the pandemic not only were we isolated i think it was even more shameful to start talking about that yeah yeah, well, I, I try to hold space as much and as often as possible uh, for as many people as I possibly could. A lot of people held space for me, for sure. I feel very lucky that I had that, you being one of those people. Um, but I think the patriarchy plays into it. A lot of the times this idea that we are weaker because we have emotions and reactions right. is wrong. And it only hurts the people who want to appear to be stronger uh, because, of course, you're going to have feelings. Well, and we're going to have feelings that are screwed up. You might be a therapist, but I I joke around and for all my therapist friends, don't take this personally. And if you do talk to me, I I joke around sometimes. Oh, you're a therapist. You must be very stable. I'm like, oh, therapists are probably the most screwed up people I've ever met up there with nurses for the record. and primary care doctors absolutely and people like really and i'm like yeah really and again if any therapist doctors or anyone who has a problem with that please call me and i will discuss it with you and i will prove my point but because i know for me i talk about the pandemic and you know the substances thankfully i'm gonna knock on wood for real because i didn't fall back into that thankfully Mm -hmm. um but I also know that even kind of like feeling weak, I've, I talked about it in the last podcast and I mentioned in, a, you know, in my, my uh, social media, even asking, like struggling for a week of just like, am I going to tell people I'm struggling was like, and I wasn't struggling for a week. I was struggling for a couple months. That's and right. yeah, but yeah, that's fine. For, no, no, no. It's fine for Jen. It's not mine. Fine for Steve. It's fine for, uh, frank but it's not fine for steve and i think that we carry that i i don't know what to call it but bullshit role is the best way i can put it because i i'm i'm no better than anyone i'm just a human being and i think that that's the hard part for us as practitioners and yes nurses mental health social workers uh doctors yeah, we're no better than any other human being. We just happen to have a different title. Yeah. Like I know how to handle your crisis in an emergency. <laughs> right. <laughs> how, would I be able to do it on my own in the middle of my own crisis? No, I'm sorry. That's not actually how it works. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't be able to apply the same principles to myself. That's, it would be too easy if it was like that. In my, I'm truthful. I think we talked about this off air, but you know, like we're, we're a new age therapist now. And what I call about new age doesn't mean like, well, we do believe in rocks, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like, for me, like if a client asks me how I'm doing, I'm going to be like, if I'm not doing good, I'll be like, yeah, not that great today, but I'm here. And as long as you don't make yourself the primary focus of the session, it's fine to say that. Uh, But I think it's hard for me to admit it to anyone because I, even for me, I, I, you talked about the patriarchy. I carried the whole, like, we look professional bullshit. And 
yeah, your, your job, like it, I, I felt through the pandemic, like I needed to be there for other people. Cause you know, that's what I'm trained for. Well, unless I don't know what your school was, but, and I said this before, I missed the class where how to deal with a pandemic. I was probably absent that day, but <laughs> that's exactly what happened. We weren't there. And so trying to humanize ourselves is really hard. And I'm sure that, you know, I think about your friend and still sorry for your loss. I know I didn't say it on the podcast. I know we've talked privately about this. He must have felt so alone. And here's the thing. That's the part that gets me the most because this was the most social. Everyone loved him. He gave everyone everything all of the time. He was number one staff because all the patients thought he was the best and he was the favorite. And it's true that he was the best. Like, I don't, I don't even mean it. Like I, I was good, but it was because he trained me and he role modeled for me how to talk to people and how to handle certain situations or how not to react to certain situations and how he would use humor and all that great stuff. It just, to me, it's so sad that at the end of the day, the one person who brought so many people so much joy in the worst days of their lives, because we were working in an inpatient psychiatric unit. So you don't get there unless something happened. Right. You get actually locked up after you get locked up. That's a section 12 and then it's a section eight and nine. So so that's a different one. Right. (laughs) That's when the doctors have reviewed the information about you and said, yeah, you're gonna have to stay. Yeah. For a couple of days, actually, until we decide, unless you want to stay here voluntarily, which is different, right. which I recommend. But he had a way of helping people through those moments. I mean, imagine waking up after a very serious suicide attempt and you're hooked up to machines because, well, now you're in medical trouble. And this particular face is the one that brings you joy every day. And somehow we couldn't do that for him. So I feel like we failed him. We didn't know that this was going on at this level. Um, Sure, it could have also been just like bodies giving up. But I know that, you know, my friend was struggling because he had been struggling just like the rest of us from the very beginning. I just think that nobody was able to be there for him in the same way. Mm -hmm. And it's sad because that's a big loss for our entire community, for our entire business. I mean, I wanted him to work in private practice. He was going to school to become a therapist, uh, like a licensed therapist. Because when when I met him, I was an intern. And then he just continued that track. Mm -hmm. But I I kept pushing him. And I was like, no, 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 you'd be a fantastic, you'd be a better therapist than the rest of us. Hello, duh. And he never made it. And I feel like we weren't there for him in the the way that he needed it. So that's really sad, um, unfortunately. And like that, a bunch of people, I mean, good friends of mine who are neighbors of mine, the police department posted on Facebook uh, the reason for their overdose. And it was a couple who died at the same time. Yikes. They overdosed at the same time together. Rich people, people with good businesses, wonderful networks, could have called any of us in a situation. Like I would have been there in a couple minutes. But we had no idea right that this was going on and it's just like this is it was so silent and it and i hear you now what you're saying about not being able to talk about it had you just been able to talk about it it would have been better right if someone is kind of like walking with you in hell you know it's like i i'm okay with being in hell i just don't want to be in hell by myself right well we could never be in a crisis ourselves all the time though right <laughs> You know, and yet, <laughs> you know, the, the, I, I hold it as a privilege when people reach out to me. Um, and I think that sometimes when people get a negative reaction to reaching out for help, then it kind of like deters them from that. And instead of seeing someone as whatever they see it, I don't want to judge. But for me, um, you call me. My client calls me, my client I haven't seen in three years calls me. It's a privilege for, to feel that they feel that comfortable with me. And I think that for, we can, sometimes you can see it, sometimes you don't. But for me, I think it's hard to kind of like, all right, I'm having a hard time with X, Y, Z. It doesn't matter what it is. 
Well, in a pandemic, Jen's also going through a pandemic. She probably doesn't have time. You know what? Forget it. I'm just going to do it on my own. Mm. And I think that that's the, th- I'm, not, I'm just sharing my thought process. I don't have any particular problem right now, but that's kind of sometimes what happens is that that shame kicks in because we talk ourselves out of reaching out for help too. Oof, deadly. But you know, it happens all the time. You know, I, it, the the substance stuff, and particularly in the pandemic, I've had a few people reach out to me because of that stuff. And they call me up and I'm like, you, they, you know, and I'm going to say a general story. There's no one's story here. Oh, I just relapse. I'm always the weirdo that goes, all right. They're like, what do you mean? All right. Well, you call me and you trusted me with your information. That's amazing. Let's work together. Let's see what we can do. I might, you know, we'll figure it out. Yeah. And if you show the enthusiasm, sometimes it helps the individual not feel so shamed. And the, the hard part during a pandemic is that we can always defer to, well, they're going through a pandemic and they had their own issues. They've struggled with this. And I think that that plays a factor tremendously when you think about the, the higher rates right now of alcoholism, of cocaine use, of THC use. And I, I don't think fentanyl is per se higher, but it's just more pure and more obtainable and it's being laced in other drugs that's causing a lot of the overdoses. Again, I'm not a st- statistician, but it's just my observation from afar. So I think that our job, and maybe you can tell me more what you think, but our job is to kind of like work on killing the shame before it occurs. Oh yeah. To establish the rapport so that way you can call me with any question. I mean, I got to make it a, 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 such a comfortable environment, particularly for young women to talk about like female help things, ask me questions because when I was younger and I was scared and I didn't know what anything meant, I need to hear your questions. So that way we can, uh, I'll answer it like real quick, like, oh, no, this is what's going on. It's simple. Here's what you do. Um, But it's scary, uh, especially during a pandemic when access to doctors actually declined as well. Uh, Because I know a lot of people reached out for help. And for the very first time ever in my company, we had a wait list. Again, with all the guilt in my heart of like, oh, how can we make people wait for this? I mean, that's why we've been hiring people left and right. It's just there's not enough therapists to meet the demand. And a whole that's a whole other podcast just in like, the, the, the readiness and the access and how quickly we can get to everyone. Um, but it was, it, it, it is overwhelming actually the amount of people looking for help right now at the verge of like, I don't know if I can take it anymore. Well, I think it's a double-edged sword, right? I think that for me, and I'm going to speak for me, but I do know at least 10 to 12 other therapists during the pandemic, I've received a lot of phone calls of this is my first time reaching out. I just can't take it. I'm anxiety ridden. I'm depressed. I want to drink all the time or, and I'm just throwing out ideas, but you know, general calls, not all three, usually one or two of those. And then yeah. you take them on and you take them on. Cause you have a big, I have a big heart. I can think, like I said, 10 to 12 other people who have a big heart, but then it fucks you up because it's not because the person, like I said, I, I'm not, I've learned to have a healthy detachment for stories because if you work with trauma as much as I do and you work with substance abuse as much as I do, you kind of like, and I'm, I can only speak for me, you learn this healthy detachment and not in a, I don't care way, but I need to protect myself way. But I got to yeah. 150% of capacity. My detachment abilities were gone. And I can say that my burnout that I talked about in the last podcast came from just wanting to help so many people and then having to say no and breaking my heart. And I think that that's where we've come to such a head in this crisis of mental health and substance abuse counseling. Let's not forget about the substance abuse counseling, the, the the crisis. What's that? That is straight up mental health. I know people like to categorize it as separate. It's the same. It's one, just one category, essentially. Like it's so common, even when families are not aware, it's way more common than people think. It's one thing. Substance abuse has to do with mental health, period. You're drinking, snorting, injecting, 
feeling whatever any type of substances it's probably because you can't handle something mentally so how can yeah. it not be yeah. yeah you know so i think that for me the, the crisis that we're going to have and i think we can have a whole podcast on that and you obviously know you're reinvited if i have to say it out loud um but I think that the other crisis is that not only do we, we lost a lot of therapists to the pandemic. I know therapists who have overdosed. I've known therapists who have no longer in this field because they've just couldn't take it. And I know other therapists that went and to be perfectly honest, I'm part of that group too. Coaching's a lot easier. Coaching's a lot more manageable. I don't need to deal with the insurance. It's not, you know, listening to traumatic histories or substances. It's helping them people in the here and now and moving them forward. And do you think that, you know, that, that that's what part of the issues with substances and in pandemic has caused in this country? Because before the pandemic, we were about 12,000 therapists short in this country. That's it. Well, that, that was the number the APA stand, stood for. So my guess is psychologists, but I'm, I'm not going to judge the study. I'm just saying that that's what it was said. I don't know how many we're short of, but we're not only losing people to loss, period, dying, people keep quitting, people feeling overwhelmed, and now we're having more and more people needing more and more support, which is, to me, the greatest thing in the world, yet at the same time, also burning out therapists. And yeah. we're, we're creating such a crisis right now that is very, very scary to me of what this is going to look like in five years for the mental health counseling therapy community. Yeah. It's funny you say that because last year at the tail end of the election, a couple therapists called me and basically said, listen, I can't talk to people about this anymore. Like I, I, I am at a, at a point of not just regular burnout, but I cannot keep talking about the same atrocities over and over again. I'll give you an example. Um, when the Black Lives Matter protests happened and, and we were watching video after video of black men being shot and killed in different parts of the country, it almost seemed like we were averaging two or three a week. Mm -hmm. That deeply affected me. That deeply affected so many people, in fact, who came to therapy, who were already engaged. Right. That, my, that then the supervision with the therapist became... All right, so you've been repeating yourself around this and everyone is bringing it to, to your attention. It feels like the world is ending. It, it, and there was a hilarious meme that came out that is funny because it was true, but messed up, where it showed, it, it portrayed therapists as the violinist at the end of the Titanic. As the Titanic is sinking, we're just going to play some nice music for people to be able to at least die in a, <laughs> in a more comfy way, in a more like enjoyable way at least we have some background music you know at least i have somebody here to enjoy this oppression with and uh that, that and i don't have an explanation for it and i don't know how exactly we got here i have an idea of how exactly we got there um but as the hate crimes continued because just because we had the presence of COVID against Asian Americans or Asian people in general. Uh, and then Black Lives Matter took a completely different turn and every person who was killed in the last two summers unnecessarily in front of all of us live on Facebook. Right. Was a trauma that we all had to deal with. And I think that led to a whole lot of other issues, even for the people that didn't affect, it affected hopefully in a good way, in a way of like knowing that, Hey, we can't, we, this is not sustainable either. Right. And it's like, Oh, do you, we think it's going to quietly go away. And also in standing with the people who were protesting, I feel like people needed to get that off their chest, that anger and that fear of being killed. Right. Fueled actual fire. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that it happened. It needed to happen. And in the event that we continue to kill people, it will happen more. Uh, I'll but agree. Reaction, I'll agree. Reaction, you know. And I agree with you. The only thing I won't agree with, and it's not a full disagreement, 
it's the disagreement of again creating an environment where like you're with us or you're against us right because that's this that's the part that gets to me in regards to that because i have i i you know i i, I my favorite meme is about you know people who say uh Black lives matter. No, all lives matter. I said, well, if I say save the whales, I didn't say fuck the dolphins. I just said <laughs> save the whales. Um, and, and, you know, people don't get that. And it's just about equality and treating people equally. And some people are more impressed than others, but it becomes like, oh, so you're with them. And I'm like, no, I work with cops all the time. All the cops I work with, they're like, they're appalled about what happened. Not all cops are doing that either. We got to stop creating this mentality that you're one or the other. And I think that that's the biggest issue that I have in regards to like a lot of this thought process is that people watch on TV, they make their opinion, unchecked thoughts, and either they turn around and they, they go and they say one side or the other, or if they have an opinion, they don't feel comfortable talking about it or people around them are not on the same page. You know what sounds like a good idea at that point? Shooting up. You know what else sounds like a great idea? Snorting a line. You know what else sounds like a great idea? Drinking or smoking or what have you. And I think that that's the other, when we think about these dichotomies, which for me, dichotomies are probably the, the, the one of the worst evils that we have. I mean, it also brings about change. But I also think that we need to start it will bring change when we get to understand that we can meet in the middle and maybe the middle is a lot more left than we want for some people. And maybe the middle is a lot more right than you feel for some people. But you got to stop thinking that it's got to be on my side or their side because on your side or their side is wrong sometimes. Well, I think it's, it's difficult to apply that when we're talking about issues of eugenics and race. Right. I think if, there is no middle ground between I want you dead. Right. No, I get that. And I hate you. You know, there, there just, there just is nowhere in the middle uh, to stand in there. There's no like, well, I kind of hate you, so maybe I want you alive, but like oppressed. No, there's nowhere in the middle there. Either we, you know, live free or die. <laughs> back to live free or die. Yep. Right. Right back. Uh, either we actually live free or die, or it sounds like a lot of people are going to die and burn because then for every action that goes unchecked, not just the thoughts, the actions that we all watch on Facebook live, and then have a whole trial years later, trying right. to pretend like we didn't all witness an actual murder over and over and over again. Right fueled by ha an essential hate crime, fueled by hatred for a person's ethnicity, race, is just, you know, the lower hanging fruit type behavior. Right. And it's just like, what did you think was going to happen that everyone's just going to kind of like be like, you know what? We're going to be really nice to everyone. And like, they'll hopefully learn to be nicer. No, not when specifically we have set out agendas to create segregation. Right. To protect only the material goods of a certain class. Right. That is a very clear line that I can see of like, there is no middle ground on this. Either you're okay with everyone being alive and everyone coming here and immigration and abortion and all these things, right? It's like all these black and white moments of you might need this, you might need that. When it comes to abortion, again, if you're not a woman, that's kind of my carry, opinion. If you don't carry a uterus and suddenly you're scared that you're going to have to use that uterus, I don't want to hear it. Right. And then we start uh, legislating penises. I think we're going to have a problem. Uh, when could we begin? I know. But that's what I mean. Like for me, I, you, when you say that, I laugh because I'm the same way. I'm like, well, I can't talk. I have an opinion, but my opinion is not really that useful because I don't have a vagina. That's how it is. And yet the people signing these laws and making abortions unaccessible in nearby states are all white penises. How is how? I love that we're on a podcast and we can say that word very easily because, you know, if we were on TV, we'd be, be bleeped out for penis. Yeah, you're not allowed you to think say so. That. Oh, I know you can't say it anymore. People are too sensitive. That's the other part too, in my opinion, 
Like you brought up an excellent point. What? Yeah, I'm serious. <laughs> I think I that, you, br- that you brought up an excellent point, though, because I, you're right. There's got to be some black and white in there. But this is where the 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 logic that I come up with, and I agree with you on that too, is that if I don't have an openness mind to think differently, and you brought it up, no, I don't know you. No, Jen, this is my way. This is my podcast. This is how it's going to be. That's where the the whole black and white thing that I meant. Maybe perhaps I should have elaborated, but that's what I mean. That we can't have black or white thinking. You got to be able to listen to new information and go. You know what? Kind of screwed up on that one. Makes sense. I didn't know that. Thank you for sharing that with me because I did not know that. Hmm. And I think that that's the stuff that I talk about when I say not going into black and white thought process. I don't know everything. What I know fits in the thimble, if that. And I'm okay with learning every single day. So if I'm wrong, hey, I was wrong and it's okay. So like, that's what I mean about with the gray area. Maybe perhaps I didn't think about it in particular sense. No, no, either, so. it, it, the, the thing about it is that I love the, like the, the, the paradigms coming together, the practices and all of that. And, it, and it's perfect. And I think these are moments and opportunities for us to bring about some real change. Um, it's just that when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, that particular argument comes up a little too often, Mm -hmm. a little too often when it comes to like, well, we have to meet somewhere in the middle. There is no middle ground between you wanting me dead and and me staying, remaining alive. There is no middle ground. So what you want me sick, right? Right. You want me what you want me poor. You want me where living where? No. Is that that, already happening though? But I digress. Huh? (laughs) I said, Aren't people doing that already? But I digress. That's what I'm saying. It's just like I've had to put an end to the whole like, let's kumbaya together and come together to find a solution. Because at this point, no, I just want to hear what people of color have to say about how they would like to be treated, actually. And I'm pretty sure it's going to be somewhere around the lines of like, allow me to live. Right. The basics. Allow me to express myself when I have a problem. Listen to me when I tell you I'm having a problem, and then we'll be, you know, happily ever after or whatever. Uh, but as long as white supremacy continues to test my patience, right? I get it. It's a, it's a totally different. I mean, you know, the the fact that you've worked with police doesn't necessarily put you in a particular position. A cop that is even likely to come to therapist to therapy would probably not even be someone who thinks that way. You see what I'm saying? It's a totally different uh, human, but I've certainly worked in correctional situations where white supremacy is being a dosed out in a healthy way every single day and everyone's supposed to comply. And even when you complain to HR, it's a problem. Right. And then guess what? It'll be a predominantly white prison for sex offenders because that's a predominantly white crime and it's just like interesting that in this particular prison the demographics are opposite ah and then we have to exalt it in some type of way and even in the way that they structure their staff everything is very different so i don't see it as one of those moments where we can come to the middle and and no in this case, when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, it is kind of black and white. It doesn't have to be us versus anyone. It should just be us, actually. Right. Uh, ideally, it could just be us, but seeing as how you're excluding me, then now I'm gonna make a big deal about it. Oh, wise guys. Right. <laughs> I, I get it. I certainly get it. And, you know, the, the stuff that... I always remind myself, and I said it, I think, in the last podcast, and I'll say it again. I'm not blind to the fact that I'm a white male. I'm not blind to the fact of the privilege that I have. So might as well use that privilege for what I think is right. And if I'm exposed to something I may be doing or people are doing that I did not see because I don't have that experience, I just don't. And it's not because I don't want to have that experience or because I'm a jerk. It's because I don't have it. Then I got to be open to that communication and that feedback and that stuff. And that's okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I think that a lot of people are like, well, no, no, no. You like, no, you have to open your mind up. I mean, it comes up even in medical communities. This is not just a correctional issue. This is not just a, a like, you know, legal issue. 
it, it becomes a medical issue from doctors perceiving black people as having higher pain tolerance. So therefore not giving them yeah. the medication It's abusive. It's sadistic. It's oppressive at a minimum. I mean, black moms are dying more during labor than anybody else. Why? Why is America rank in the middle of the pack for death at birth? <laughs> Best doctors in the world. What's going on? Right. Why, why is it a particular patient group being affected only? That's interesting. Hmm. Right. I, I can't remember what show was on, but there's always a clip that I liked about how people say America is the best country in the world. And he goes, America is not the best country in the world. And he talks about all these facts and everybody's jaws drop. And I'm sitting there going, why is your jaw dropping? I love my country. I love my countries. Right. I don't think it's the best at everything. I just love my countries. And it's okay if they're not the best. Either I'm part of the problem or part of the solution, but I can't just sit there and go, well, that's just how it is. And kind of like that stuff is, you know, the reason why I will go in the trenches if I have to for any type of situation. And if I don't understand the trench, I might say, look, I'm scared. I'm afraid. I don't understand this trench. Can you help me? And that doesn't mean I'm going to necessarily jump in, but please help me. And I think that's hard. Component of like research that people can also do if they're scared and confused. You can research about a culture. You can research, you know, you can Google it in the same exact way that I'm expected to Google and understand context in a language that is not my first language. Right. So I, I think that we cannot put the burden of solving racism on people of the different color instead instead of just saying hey you know what we should really uh, educate ourselves as much as possible travel as often as you possibly can go to different countries see what it's like because what i'm finding is that a lot of the folks who have these hateful ideas um and hateful thoughts have never been outside of this country so of course you would think it's the very best you've never been outside of here but for example, I don't see you as a person who struggles with something like that because you've lived in a different country. So you, so you, you see the differences. Like there are areas that are better in Canada than here. I hear the healthcare system is wonderful there, yeah. in a different way than here. Yeah. And yet it has its flaws. And <laughs> yet there's things that we could definitely, you know, fix from here and take from there, right. and, and vice versa. But unless we're traveling and seeing it and enjoying it and appreciating other people's cultures, foods, traditions, rituals. How are we going to learn? I was talking to a friend of mine this weekend about just that. Because we're, we're talking about how if your view of Mexico is Puerto Playa, Playa or whatever, where the resort is, or that you go to Jamaica and you think that, you know, where the resort you're in in Jamaica is what Jamaican culture is, you have no clue what the culture is. You're just going to another country to, Amer to I'm just going to say Americanize, frankly, white western hemisphere your situation go to jamaica and go to a village and go to a wedding now we'll talk that's going to be a little more authentic you know you can go to montreal and go to all the nice little uh you know touristy type of traps as i call them or i can show you real montreal and real life around there um i think that that's the other part is that you know not every family is like the Brady Bunch. Not every family is like the Cosby family. Not every family is um, anything you see on TV. Real life happens somewhere else. And we need to realize that our experience with culture, going to Amsterdam and going to the red light district is not a Dutch culture. Right. You know, no, that's the red light district in Amsterdam and you're the right person there because that's the tourist trap in the area. And that's what attracted you to it. It's just like, oh, or, you know, it's, it's, I wish people could travel more often. And I think something interesting actually around this happened in Puerto Rico at the beginning of the pandemic. Suddenly when flights became 39.99, and flying and traveling became accessible to everyone suddenly. A lot of the people who invested in buying those cheaper tickets were able to fly a little bit more. And then in the countries that they went to, either acted completely inappropriately because they'd never been before, 
or were faced with even more oppression from those countries because they were like, well, these are not the American tours that we're used to. This happened in Puerto Rico. Right. They kept calling like, oh, the people from Miami are here. Oh. And it was like, just because it's a person that is even darker, it's like, that's not a reason to hate them for being here. They're so open to the culture, still wanting to come here. Are people going to act ridiculous everywhere they go? Yeah, probably. Uh, are Americans more likely to do that? Unfortunately, so I don't know why. Um, but it was interesting because in Puerto Rico, a little bit of a kind of like, <laughs> it's not reverse racism because that doesn't exist in that way. It was just more of like a, the reason why people didn't like the certain type of tourists that were pulling through is because it wasn't people with a whole lot of money to spend. And it's just like, well, that's, is it because they're black or what do you mean? Cause we're black here too. I don't, <laughs> I don't see how that even computes, but it's, it's a class struggle. It's a class bias. It's a class hate bias, but well, we all have biases. I mean, you know, when, when, when I talk about, you know, we, we went from talking about substance abuse in the pandemic to a lot of like cry, like a real, like what I consider like real life problems, you know, when people ask me, are you racist? I, yeah, I am. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, because I don't know everything and I got to learn. So I have isms that I need to challenge. So I'm not purposely good. Well, I'm fine. People tell me all the time. It's like, well, you say racist shit all the time. And I'm like, sure. <laughs> and yet not really. And yet I'm constantly fighting against it. And please, when you identify something oppressive that I've said, let me know. Right. And I will immediately look into this. Right. Instead of being like, well, I'm not racist and I'm not this and I'm not that. It's like, actually, if I've acted in a way that I've hurt you, even if it was not my intention, I still hurt you. Yeah, I don't speak Canadian. I speak English and French. Yeah. <laughs> and and I don't speak French Parisian either. I speak Quebecer. <laughs> and... <laughs> And that, you know, like I tell people, like, again, it's it, it, you, you got to challenge constantly. And if you don't challenge yourself, you're going to get stuck in your ideas. And that's why, like, you know, we all have boxes. And I'm always saying people, it's OK to have boxes as long as you're willing to open them and kind of challenge them. But if you have your box and anyone who doesn't fit in that box is kind of like wrong, then that's what's racism and isms come from, because we all can be challenged in our views of the world. And that's OK. I, I don't see a problem with that. So I, I think that, you know, one day I got to go down to Puerto Rico, I'm sure. And, uh, get learn, learn a lot more than I know, because I, you know, obviously I just know what I know and probably 50% of it is wrong anyway. Well, all I know is that every single time, even I go to Puerto Rico, I fall in love with it all over again. The last time I went, I got to go to a cocoa farm, never in my life. Had I seen Coco that close up or, you know, where does chocolate come from? How do you make it? Right. <laughs> but to have the actual fruit, it was just like, I'm falling back in love with my own country all over again. It's and not that- made by Nestle. <laughs> all I know is a bee got me. Okay. I got, <laughs> I got, got stung. stung. All right. I got stung and they just removed the stinger weeks later. So it was intense. Okay. I sacrificed to get there. It was amazing. And it was, healthy and beautiful. Um, and it made me fall in love with a different side of my island that I don't usually go to. It was actually in a private reserve. I would have never had access to get to there. Um, but every time I've been to Jamaica and every time I've been to these other islands, I try to stay as far away as possible from this tourist trap part, especially when I go to Hawaii, for example part of the United States, but they have their own culture going on and their own levels of colonization going on for hundreds of years. And the history is fascinating and their language is fascinating. And the food is incredible. The geography is crazy. Everything about Hawaii is interesting. Um, but I would have never known that it was, that it's very similar to Puerto Rico and the way it's being treated by the United States unless I had been there. Like I, I try to learn as much as possible. And I have to say that for me personally, the weight of the world's ignorance around diversity, equity, and inclusion does get me to those points of feeling like I can't do it anymore. I would like to use anything at this point, you know, get me whatever sugar is available, please. 
these are the top, I know that we didn't necessarily mean to talk about this and we kind of got to here, but it is related, uh, at least for me. I'm not a script. To, huh? I'm not a script. Yeah, no, it is. It gets to unbearable levels for me all the time, all the time. And, and I think, and I think that this is a good conversation because it, it needs to be said in those ways and needs to be discussed in that way. And that's why, like, for me, I, I, I don't follow a script. I did have, you know, I have my sheet now that we have video, there's a sheet next to me that I don't think the camera catches, but I do have a sheet. We went off script. I don't care. That's kind of like all my interviews are kind of like that. I, we end up talking about a lot more stuff than I scripted. And so, you know, that, you know, what that means though, unfortunately, Jen, as we approach the end again, because I want to try to keep it to an hour. Um, that means you're going to have to come back again. Set the date and time. You, you know, I will, but I, I promise to have a microphone. <laughs> Well, I promise you one thing. I promise that we, you know, the, in the two episodes, the time I glanced to the time, I went, holy crap, went fast. Uh, number one. Number two, you're so personable. You're so nice. I, I, I love our conversations. And, you know, a lot of stuff that I, I probably will say off air, but I'll just say thank you. And that you can always count on me. I know I can count on you. So thank you for that. And uh, looking forward to our next episode. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. And if anyone needs to contact me or has any questions, you can always Please do. reach me at getaonhelp at gmail.com. That's G-E-T-A-E-O-N-H-E-L-P at gmail.com. Thank you, Steve, for having me always and letting me talk about it. <laughs> well you know there was a different type of intense on this one uh from the last episode and the intensity was right there again and thank you so much and um see you soon okay